and welcome to Better Than Mario Brothers, where each episode we dive deep into cinema's sewer. I am Chris Bolton. With me, as always, my partner in podcasting, Mr. Mark Williams. Hello. And this episode, we are carrying on our celebration of the end of Game of Thrones. We've rewatched every single episode over on our other show, Game of Moans. If you haven't listened to that, go and listen to that. It took us a long time. Um, but, but we are wrapping up this evening with Better Than Mario. And, and we thought, well, we've either got to look for something with dragons, of which there are many, many films with dragons, and we were a little bit spoiled for choice. So then we thought, well, let's dive into the back catalogue of some of the Game of Thrones cast. And surprisingly, it's not that bad. Like, we, no. we really expected Amelia Clark and Kit Harington and Peter Dinglish to have done some absolute shite. Um, there's nothing really terrible, though. I mean, there's some not great films there, but nothing yeah. awful. So we started to dig a little deeper. And then out of nowhere, this bright, shining beacon of terrible reviews on IMDb <laughs> popped up for a film called Domino, directed by Brian De Palma, uh, released in, I think it was 1990-something, was it? Or oh, 2019, sorry. 20, not 2019, 19, yeah. I was, For some reason, I was going to say 1999. What the fuck? Released yeah, no. in 2019, uh, and starring not Jess, Nicholas Casterwalder, but also Carice Von Houten. So we were like, well, we've got to. There are two Game of Thrones alumni in this. We've got to watch it. And, you know, just for reference here, when I say that the reviews are bad, um, I'll just read you a handful of these reviews <laughs> before we start off, just to give you a, a sous-son, if you will, uh, a flavour of why we decided to look at this film, besides the fact it was free. Um, so, two stars. What the F? Whoever wrote the score, brackets, music, for this movie should be stabbed in the ears in great big capital letters. That was the one that first caught my eye. Uh, but but then, you know, it goes on. You know, if, if you look for some more, there are there are plenty more. One out of ten. Stupid. This movie gave the viewer no credit or the police officers. Don't even know what that means. Um, one out of ten. Don't waste your time. One sentence. Nothing good about this movie in inverted commas <laughs> De Palma's worst ever um, and then one of my favourites uh, it's a little bit rambling this uh, 1 out of 10, count the tomatoes 10 minutes in so many scenes with tomatoes they are delicious looking tomatoes I told my husband we would turn it off when we see the next set of tomatoes, literally 30 seconds later, tomatoes at least 7 scenes with tomatoes in the first 10 minutes if you like tomatoes, watch this film the rest of the content a bit rotten. Wah, wah. <laughs> I mean, okay, that, that, it's it's a fair point to an extent because yes, there are a lot of tomatoes in the opening, uh, in, well, in the first act, but they're kind of important to the plot. They uh, are plot, very plot, important. Plot and inverted commas, but you know, it's yeah. it's you no, know, they, they are they they're there for a reason. It's not just because the Palmer's got a tomato fetish. As far as I'm aware, he may do, he may not. I do, I neither know nor care. But they are yeah. actually kind of important to the film. They are. And just before we move on from these, there are loads of them and they are very, very funny listeners, both on Amazon and IMDb. I'm reading you the ones from IMDb here. But this is quite possibly my favourite review title ever. Uh, one out of ten, reviewed by somebody called Talikni uh, in 2019 on IMDb. One out of ten, how to get eye cancer. And <laughs> I had not seen that one. <laughs> I mean, these reviews are great. So we yeah, went into this with I, is high expectations the right word? High, oh, high, low expectations. Low expectations I guess, that. yeah. But you know, in the best possible way. So yeah, yeah. we decided we'd look at Domino. Like I said, we've got uh, Nicola Castor-Walder and we've got Chris Van Houten here. So we we had to have a look at it. Um, now, look, I'm I'm not going to bury the lead here. Um, I didn't mind this at all. I don't know what people are on about. Um, um, it's not I, good. I have issues with it, but it's certainly not the worst thing we've looked at. Nowhere near the worst thing we've looked at. So I'm slightly disappointed on that front. But, yeah. you know, let's, let's dive in as we do and go through. It's not good. There's plenty for us to yeah. rag on. I mean, um, just before we start, actually, um, uh, it, as you say, it does have Nicola Castlewalder and Chris Van Houten in it. Um, she wasn't originally cast. Originally, it was Christina Hendricks was cast in the role and she pulled out. 
Oh, okay. Now that's interesting then. I wonder, because I assumed the Guy Pearce connection was via her, via Nicola Castor-Walder. But maybe not then. Maybe she's in it because of Guy Pearce. And it just so happens that Nicola Castor-Walder was also in it. Who knows? There's, who knows? There's investigation to be done there, folks. Yeah, um, that's effort. Fuck that. Yeah. By the way, I will, at random points throughout this podcast, probably mispronounce both their names. I know... OK, <laughs> before anybody writes in, I know I am trying. OK, <laughs> I'm doing my best. Um, OK, so. I OK, mean, so in, in the spirit of that, before we start, I'll give you a lesson. OK, it's Guy Pierce. Pierce, like like piss. Yeah, P. Pretty much. Yeah. Like, yeah. OK, OK. I'll, I'll bear that in mind. OK, and, and De Palma, like palm tree. Yeah. Yeah. So I've, I've got I've got cue cards in front of me, so we should be OK. Um, okay, so let's start off there. I mean, my, my first thought before I even sort of dove into this, like I said, we, we came at it with very low expectations. But, yeah. you know, as any of you that have listened to Game of Moans will be aware, um, I like Nicola Castor-Walder a great deal. A great deal. I think he is a phenomenal actor. I, I argued in our last episode that actually maybe on our rewatch, Jamie Lannister is actually my favourite character in the show. So this had to work really hard to convince me otherwise that like i think he's a great actor i think he's got charisma to spare so this had to work really hard to to lose me um it, it was there for the taking so i'm just laying that out there as well and that definitely factors in as does you know i also have a great deal of respect for chris von houten as well and i've, I've mentioned that many times on, on the other show so you know and guy pierce is always great so all the pieces yeah. are in place here like it's it's like a game of darts, this. Okay, we're <laughs> subtracting here. We, we're starting from a position of strength. So, okay. Um, first thing, though, and this has been mentioned in the reviews as well, and yeah, I get it. I know that, I, well, I can guess what the reason is for this, but everyone has an accent in this film. Everybody, apart from Guy Pearce, well, actually, you could argue Guy Pearce has got an accent as well, but anyway, you get what I mean. Everybody adopts an accent to let you know that this film is set somewhere other than America. Yeah, yes. it's actually set on various parts of, of Europe, okay? It, yeah. it trots around a bit. But everybody has an accent. So, and this annoys me a lot in a lot of things. Why the fuck, then, is everyone speaking English? Well, Just that was, that was my thing as well. I mean, I even had a, a gripe before that, but I'll come back to that in a second. That, yeah, I mean, when you the first thing we get with, um, so with the, the leads, with Christian and uh, Lars, um, they go into this coffee shop, bakery wherever the fuck it is and when it starts off there's lots of there's lots of talking going on and it does sound excuse me it does sound as though there's some murmurings in a europe and a european language that isn't english and yeah. it's because of their accents because the, the lines are so muffled when they're coming in and they're moving and the accent the accents are being uh, are so pronounced you can't work out what the fuck they're saying and it's only once they start getting into actually ordering stuff that you realize oh they are, they are actually speaking english it just doesn't really sound like it so that was a bit of an issue for me straight away. The accents really put me off the first couple of bits. But even before that, the, I, the one thing, well, there are a couple of things that pulled me out even before that is we have a very quick establishing shot to get us in where you've got the guys on bikes right up to the camera and then the car pulls in in front of it and then we're straight into straight into dialogue. So that bugged me. But then why did they why did they put a date on it? No idea. I mean, this, this opening is, you know, there is a lot of superfluous, this is going to be very similar to an episode of Game of Moans. I promise you this. There's a lot of superfluous <laughs> stuff in this in this film that doesn't need to be there. And most of this opening segment is that. Like, yeah, we don't need to see the guys on bikes. We don't need the date. Other than that's a stylistic thing, isn't it? They want us to know that well, we're Well, then in... why date it in the future? Well, yeah, I guess. Because but then... Mean, obviously, obviously, they didn't know COVID was coming, but it doesn't age well. Because no. you know, there's people everywhere. But even so, like, why did it? What was? What's the significance of it being summer 2020, as opposed to being summer 2019 when it was when it was released? I mean, maybe they're reaching for some sort of, you know, this could happen in a year's time kind of thing. You know, because there's there's the whole questionable terrorism uh, side of it all as well. So so maybe they're kind of reaching for that kind of, 
you know, that that sort of thing. But I, I, I don't know. I mean, in terms, in terms of, sort of future terrorism, it does have a, a great deal of Osama bin Laden about it, you know, propaganda videos. and uh... it, it does. But I mean, it's also like, yes, they've dated it. Yes, it's a year in the future from when the film was made. But it's not. I mean, it's it's not a period film. It's not so no, far it's... in the future. It's, it's, it's no. set present day. So I've got no drama with them saying this is 2020. It, it was... will and has already aged the film and it will age it terribly in the future. Um, but, you know, I, that's that's more of a stylistic thing. I think, look, it's it's the first as well of. I mean, Christ, I mean, you, you've just got to follow De Palma's career, but especially here, it's the first of many, many Hitchcockian kind of devices that you'll yeah. use throughout, you know, title cards are a very Hitchcock thing to put you in that time and that place. Yeah. Um, it's one of those. What what we don't need is the entirely pointless scene in the coffee shop, as you say, which is literally just two dudes going in and ordering. Yeah, it, it's, it's the nothing start of a, It's a start of a scene, and then we lose the rest of it. Um, but, you know, other than that, the stuff with them in the car when it opens, I'm absolutely yeah, fucking I'm, I'm, loving it. I have no issue with that whatsoever. I think it's great. Like, I mean, we've know, had that conversation about yeah. our own cars, about the fucking mess and all that. We've done that ourselves. Yeah, I, I think it's great. You know, Nicola Castawalder is already charming as hell, you know, yeah. when he's busting out, like, oh, can I come to dinner tonight? You know, and it's very clear that these... I mean, the other guy's clearly dead immediately. Oh, like, absolutely. It, you know, he's, they're clearly, you know, like more family than partners, you know, and then he invites himself to his house and we get to meet the wife and they've got this plan to, like... Yeah travel the world and go on holiday and it's like right okay you are dead you are yeah. dead within the next 10 minutes no yeah, doubt you about get, it you, you're not getting out of that one no it, it's cliched as hell okay but i mean it all works and i'm up for a bit of fucking yeah. buddy cop espionage nonsense yeah. and the chemistry I mean, between them is really good yeah you know so, i mean so far i mean as i say no we we're at this point we're about what five minutes in yeah um and you know aside, aside from that rant no, the the really really pointless establishing shot at the beginning and the bit in the diner I'm 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 on board with this. I'm fine. Totally on board with it. Um, it does lose me briefly, and this is about the only time I'm going to criticise the framing here because I've got a lot of very positive things to say uh, about the about the framing and the composition in this film. But when we do actually go uh, to the house for dinner, there is this absolutely disgusting low angle shot. Yeah. I I don't know why it's even there. No, I couldn't uh, work that one out either. Absolutely and gross. I mean, I think that part of the issue is um, they're in a, they're in too small a space. I think possibly. I think Poss- they're, I think it's because it's not. You know, it's the only time we're ever in this this space, so it's not as if they need to go back to it. So they, it's not as if they've had to fit anywhere out. So they just want to fuck it. I've got a dining room or a kitchen with a dining table in it. That'll do. And when they've actually got into it, there's not really enough room to move around. So yep. you've got a very um, a very staid, very static scene. The only the only real movement you get is the wife in the background. Yeah, um, got, and then that's kind of it. But yeah, it it, it just feels everything's a bit, everything's too on top of each other. Yeah, I mean the, the master is is fine. That's well composed and it's well lit. It's just that disgusting low angle shot of of Nicola Castawalder is mm. absolutely gross. Um, and and yeah, I. I'd wager this film is is quite low budget, and I would also wager the majority of that budget has gone on Brian De Palma. Um, so you I'm know, just looking to see if I can find a budget for it. I can't imagine it cost very much. Looking at what they've done with it, um, well, I mean, it, got, did, it didn't make a lot. I know that. No, I mean you got Guy Pearce in there. He doesn't come cheap either. Um, but De Palma's you know, not going to come cheap. Even that, that's what the career he's at. No, he's, he's not coming cheap. Castle Wall is coming off the back of Game of Thrones, so. Yeah. You know, your, your three stars ain't coming cheap. No, so I, I suspect that's where most of the money's gone. Now, we'll talk about that as we go through. I think there's an argument to be made for that, actually, as well. Um, because certainly without them, th- this is awful, without a yeah. shadow of a doubt. Um, so, I mean, so this, is straight, this is straight to DVD fodder anyway, or straight to streaming fodder no, anyway. Yeah, it absolutely, this, this feels... Uh, no, I'll save that for summing up. But yeah, you're right. It is it is kind of straight to streaming as it is now, or, or straight to DVD. Um, so yeah, the partner is clearly super fucking dead. Yeah. Um, you know, right. So Nicola Caswaller leaves, and then for no reason whatsoever other than, look, it's Brian De Palma, so why not tits? Tits yeah. and bush and ass for no reason other than Brian De Palma, so we've got to throw them in there. Yeah, like, now, again, had no issue with that. The thing I took issue with in this scene, right, when you have fat people who can't fit into skinny jeans, they lie in the bed and try and yank them up, right? Yeah. Who the fuck put jeans on like that? 
Uh, yeah, it's weird well, he's the way he puts his kick, jeans on. He's lying on the bed, kicking his legs around, trying to get them into a pair of it's, fucking jeans. It's weird. He's like a toddler, isn't he? Yeah. He, he's like a toddler on the bed doing some it's sort of wooden movement. Yeah, and yeah. is it just to wake her up so you can have another fumble before he goes? I don't know. I mean, to me, the whole point as well is that he's kind of in a bit of a rush because he's running late now. So surely it's better if he gets up and does the kind of, you know, Marty dress on the fly, or hop on the fly. Yeah, put it, put one leg in. And, and then it's more forgivable he forgets his gun as well. I mean, it's still not forgivable that he forgets his gun. No, it's I've not. Got but at least, if, he, at least if there is... If there was a point where he's like, oh, shit, he was going to pick me up at 4 o'clock, now it's 4.02, yeah. and he's ringing the bell, and he's pissed, and I've got to get dressed really quickly, and I've got to try and not wake her up, even though the doorbell should have woken her up anyway. And at that point, if he's then out the door, still getting dressed as he goes, at least then you can understand that, oh, fuck, I didn't pick my gun up. Yeah, I mean... I mean, without lingering on it for 25 seconds. It, yeah, I mean, talk about Chekhov's gun. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is it in reverse well, as gun. it goes. Yeah, this is it in, in reverse because yeah. th- this gun obviously doesn't get fired. Um, but Jesus Christ, the slow zoom into the gun and the score, like De Palma really does need to get over his Hitchcock thing. Now, having said that, he he executes it perfectly throughout this mm-hmm. film. It is all very Hitchcockian. But like, yeah, it, it just comes out of nowhere, the zoom on the gun. Once you bed into it, which yeah. which I which I do very shortly, once you bed into it, you're like, no, okay, this is actually really well executed. But here I was just like, what the fuck? And it's because it's so ridiculous that yeah. he forgets his gun in the first place. That is like, look, you are a fucking police officer and you carry a firearm. That yeah. is like, and un- that's unforgivable. That's like, you know, keys, wallet, gun. Yeah. Like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, how do you do that? You know, like if I if I go to work in the morning, like, if I get out the front door and I don't have my van keys, I instantly go back in and go, oh, yeah, I haven't got my van keys because I need those for work. Yeah. Like, same thing with a gun, sure. Well, that, that's that's it. I, mean, I do the same now because we're we're not in the office every day. So on the occasions I do go in, so the first thing I do, I'll, I'll, I'll get dressed. I'll go downstairs and I'll put my lanyard around my neck so I don't forget to take my card because otherwise I've gone all the way to work mm. to not get into the fucking building. Yeah, exactly. So, like, so you know, it's kind of essential. Yeah, yeah as, as is a gun when you're a police officer. Yeah. Besides the fact, it's a fucking murder weapon. Like, how do you... I, I, I do not for a second buy the gun thing. But anyway, all right, fair enough. Now, as if that isn't bad. We that, before we move on from that, I can't remember it's here. I know it happens a couple of times later on. I can't remember if it happens here. But we get these sort of crash zooms within frame. Yes. And I, do they do that on the gun or is that later on? Yes, no, it's on the gun. But yeah. Because I yeah. found that... I found that quite annoying. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's, you get well, no, it's not. It's not so much a crash zoom. There's a very slow zoom into the gun. Uh, no, um, we, I know. Later on, we get um, we get a so we'll, we'll we'll zoom slow and then it'll, so it's not a crash zoom. It'll, it'll cut in the frame. So we'll it'll zoom. It'll, so it will be zooming in from here. Then it's there. Then it's there, and it just keeps jumping around. Yeah, so, yeah. So that I found that quite jarring. I, I can't. I couldn't remember if they did it on the gun or not. I don't think they did. No, it's it's a very very slow zoom into the gun with yeah. Because you start quite wide, don't you? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, and then you get the score behind it as well. Now, again, people have criticised the score on IMD, and without a shadow of a doubt, there are places where the score is very intrusive here. Yes, um, but for most of the time, I actually think the score is pretty successful. Like it adds a lot too, of tension. Yeah, it's I was say it's not. Oh, it's not overstated for most of the no, time. I think. Look, this is not a good film. Okay, there are, there are problems with this film. But I think a lot of the criticism that's being levelled at it, and I and I don't mean to attack people on the internet because fucking hell they'll come back at me. Um, I think you are either dialed into this or you're not. And th- this isn't me being a film snob or anything like that. But you're either dialed into what he's doing here, the fact that this is very clearly a film from another era that has been made in 2019. This is very very clearly a Hitchcockian sort of or wants to be at least a Hitchcockian yeah. thriller i mean it, um, at, at, be, at best it's day. a sort of it's it's a low-grade neo-noir yes uh and, and it's, it's very clear and, and if you dial into that then actually the score is quite successful and things yeah. like the slow zoom and a lot of the the sort of dutch angles that we get and the tilts and the, the lighting especially is all actually very successful i think hmm. um it's not original which i think is why a lot of people are coming at this now in, in 2019 or 2020, whenever they watched it, and expecting, you know, what we get from a modern thriller, which yes. which is the 24 handheld style, yeah. the constant cutting in the frame. You know, that's what you expect to see, your bleached out palettes. That's what yeah. you expect to see now 
in a, in a thriller like this, particularly yeah, any sort of terrorism or espionage thriller. That's what you're expecting to see. And this isn't that. This throws back to a much slower pace, to a simpler time in filmmaking as well. Yeah. Um, and actually, I quite enjoyed that. And I think it's executed very, very well. Um, it's the fucking story that lets this down. I think technically... Yes it's executed very well and we'll, we'll talk more as we go through um but that that's my feeling on the reviews with this i i think like I, I definitely agree that it's not good but i think it's very unfair to to criticize the score there are places where it's intrusive yes but most yeah. of the time it's successful it's certainly unfair to criticize the performances because actually i think they're all very very good um and it's it's just downright criminal i think to criticize De Palma because for what he's doing here he's working with what he's got okay this yeah. is the script he's got and well, i, I, I mean, think does a very good job with it i was going to throw back to that later on um there's a quote um on the wiki page um from De Palma um where he said um he he, he denies rumors that the, the final cut was shortened against his will um it comes in 89 minutes allegedly there was a there was a 148 minute original cut Okay. Which, fuck me, that would have been um, I, what a lot. Up, yeah, but I, I'm up for that. We'll discuss that later on. But one of my main criticisms is that it is entirely too short and there's entirely yeah, the, too much going on for 89 uh, minutes. Yeah, so, so the, the pacing on its old car, but two hours 20 is, uh, or two hours 30 is a lot. Um, but anyway, but, um, he basically said, I, I wasn't involved in the ADR, the music, the final mix, the colour t- color time of the print. Um, Domino is not my project. I didn't write the script. I had a lot of problems with financing it. I never experienced such a horrible movie set. A large part of our team has not even been paid. As was my first experience wow. in Denmark, and most likely my last. There you go. Now, so I mean, no, this is this isn't the man who's enjoying his work. No, and, and let's not forget. You know, by the time you get to the stage in your career that De Palma's at making this, yeah. and I'm not a De Palma apologist. Okay, he has made some absolute shite. He's made some absolutely brilliant films, but he's made some absolute shite as well. I'm looking at you, Snake Eyes. Um, <laughs> but you know, at this point in his career, like making this, he's what nearly eighty. By the time he's making this, it's like seventy nine, yeah, seventy eight, so seventy nine. He's eighty now. Yeah, there you go. So he's like he's like seventy eight, seventy nine. Like, he doesn't have to do this. He's just a gun for hire here. He's not doing it for the love of it or anything well, like exactly. that. Well, exactly. It's a payday, isn't it? Yeah, he's probably got alimony to pay or whatever. Do you know what I mean? So he's just like, right, I'll fucking... I'll knock yeah. this fucking thing out. I get to go to Denmark. Go and see what that's like. Well, you yeah, know? So I'll, I'll get to tour Europe, basically. You know, they did uh, Spain and Belgium as well, didn't they? So Yeah, so, you know, there's that to it. But what I think what this film does advertise is even within working under duress like that, um, and we've talked about this on the on the show before, or actually it may have been on Game of Moans, um, weirdly, that we talked about it. What this does advertise very well is is actually the value of a director and what they add to a project. Yeah. Um, and, and I've talked about this at length, how so many people will place the blame for a film being good or bad squarely on the director without understanding what a director actually does. Yeah. And, you know, this this is a prime example of that. This isn't the Palmer script. He's got no control over, like you say, things like the colouring and the location and stuff like that. The production team is doing all of that and i imagine a lot of this is based in denmark and they've just hired him in what he has come in and done though is is just put this story together as best he can presented something to us in 80 odd minutes that makes sense it's not very good but it makes sense and something that is well performed incredibly well lit and incredibly well shot because actually it's his job to take all of those disparate pieces of shit that is called this production yeah. and just go, we need to make something here. And it, and it's not just the fact that he's decided where the cameras go in on any given day, or he's told Nicola Casabalda to say a line like this or whatever he's doing, what he's done is all of that at once. Okay. And that's the value in a director. And I think that actually is the strongest element of this film. You can clearly see that somebody has the reins yeah, it's just that there is so much other shit going on, and it doesn't surprise me that there's a longer cut because that is pretty much my summation. Is if this was longer, this might be. I mean, it's never going to be brilliant because of the terrorist thing, but it mm. might be half passable. Um, yeah, and I mean, I mean, we'll might as well talk about this aspect of it now. I mean, that that was my thing as well. The first act I thought was t- pacing was okay. Mm-hmm. Second act, they tried they, they introduced too much and then didn't yes. leave themselves enough time to finish it and the third act is like one of mine it's like a page and a half yeah i mean the, the problem is there's no there's no escalation of threat there's no, no. real stakes for our heroes the no, stakes the stakes actually lie 
with the terrorists. Yeah. Um, there's no there's no stakes for our heroes because they're just on a vengeance kick. Yeah. Um, now, I've no doubt that somewhere in the middle there, there is an element because they seem to actually get up to speed with the terrorist plot very, very quickly. And I'm sure there's an element in the middle there where they get dragged into this that we haven't seen. Yeah. Um, but there you go. It, the fact that it hangs together at all, I think, is a fucking miracle with everything going on. Um, and that, like I say, that's credit. To, that's credit to cast and credit to director, I think. Um, but who knows? We weren't there on the set. It sounds like it was fucking horrible. Um, so okay, so the gun thing is bad. To get back yes. to the, and then we get this great sequence in the lift. I think the, yeah. the lift sequence is very, very well done. And I, I think, in fact, this whole sequence now, again, from you know, if you look at the anatomy of the scene, the way this is put together, and the way yeah. the tension, the music. The pacing, everybody's performance is all really, really good. So much yeah. of it done as well visually without the need for our audio cues. We can see Nicola Castawalla putting everything together. You know, yeah. he doesn't he doesn't need to exclaim out loud how he's putting it together. We get those cues. Um, yeah. But the one stupid fucking thing, again, I will not buy, is why the fuck would you turn your back on a suspect to no, talk that's on the it. phone? Absolutely <laughs> ridiculous. Yeah, you've said right. You know, you you've Blair Witched him. You've stuck him in the corner. So stand there, don't fucking move. Yeah, I'm now going to turn my back on you and whistle. Yeah. So I can't that... see or hear what you're doing. It... Fucking hell! Ridiculous. Yeah. Absolutely fucking ridiculous. Besides the fact, like when he does come back downstairs, like how inept can you possibly be with a gun? Like yeah. it just <laughs> it's absolutely. So you've you've forgot your gun. So you take your partner's. Allow him to get stabbed, yeah, and then fucking drop it. Like how how inept can you possibly well, that, be with a gun? Well, that's it. And in, in all fairness, the, the the police chief does call him on it. So why don't you just fucking shoot him? It's a oh, I didn't have my gun. It's ridiculous. It's like, oh, it's, like, no. it, it's the equivalent of saying I forgot my shorts. It's absolutely ridiculous. But then the rooftop chase scene is fucking phenomenal, mm. and I will have nothing said about it. It's as close to a perfect scene as you get. The only get. thing I did think about it, and it's again, it's the um, the the, lo- the the logic at uh, the logic side of it. There's no way a fucking uh, a gutter is taking the, t- the both of their weight. No, there's not. There's not. I agree. But then like, it's a fucking. Well, there's, there's, yeah, there's there's two there's two sides from a logic thing. Either either it's a cast iron gutter which will take their weight, but it's going to shred both of their fingers. But neither of them are bleeding from the hand, or it's going to be a plastic gutter and it's going to snap. But as you say, it's a film. You got you know you got to kind of go with film. It. It, and it, um, and it, it makes for some great tension. I mean, you know, if yeah. we're, if and, we're and talking, it involves some more tomatoes. Yeah, and, and if we're talking a logic gap, I mean, to be fair, the fucking terrorist literally moves about ten foot in the, yeah. in like the two minute scene from him going out the window to. Well, not you know, it's not even that because he he you get the bit where he goes out the window and then sort of you know, breaks some tiles. He clambers over the gable. So yeah. he's already where he is. And then yeah. Christian comes down the stairs, has the whole exchange with Lars about, oh, go and get, go and get the fucker and fine, all the rest of it. And then, then he goes out the window, drops the gun, works out where he's gone, and he looks up and goes, oh, right, he's still there. And then he, you know, then he's like fucking Usain Bolt out of the blocks. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, the way he fucking comes down that fucking roof yeah. is just, yeah, but that roof sequence is beautifully composed. Uh, yeah, and, and again, it's, shot. Very suspenseful, but no, it's it's uh, you know, the timing on it's good. The the cuts as well are good because they you know like they they're quick cuts. They keep you know they keep the scene moving. I thought it worked really well. Yeah, again, it's it's just Hitchcock by numbers, and I'm I'm here for that. I'm all kinds of here for that. Um, it's it, but it is again, you have to dial into it because yeah. if you don't, then it looks like what we now think of as a pastiche of an old thriller. Yeah, because in, in in a you know in, in a born or a bond or anything, now you're looking for fucking parkour and shit like that. Yeah, whereas Which, this is kind obviously of... obviously everybody can do that. Yeah, you know. and this almost feels quaint now. You know, this yeah. is the type of thing that you'd see an aged filter on for an advert for something. You know what yeah. I mean? Whereas they're not doing... They're taking this fucking serious as a heart attack. Uh, so, you know, if you dial into that, it's... I think it's it's excellent. But I can see how people instantly bounce off it and go, what is this bullshit? Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's all very well shot. Yeah, we get tomatoes. Tomatoes are ever present, but as you say, like they're being seeded. There is a yeah. reason that they're not just the. This isn't a Godfather oranges thing. Yeah, like, the tomatoes are important. They're just yeah. being again visual storytelling. To be fair, nobody's gone. Oh my God, look at all those tomatoes! They're yeah. just constantly seeding the logo of the tomato company and for so, you. I mean, to be fair, at this point as well, they have actually given you the tomatoes in their no, for they their have. actual use. Yes. Because when, yeah. when he's gone up into the apartment and he's found um, 
Farouk and he's had his fingers cut off and all the rest of it. We find machine guns and in the cases explosives of tomatoes. in yeah, the cases yeah. of tomatoes. So right up front, they've told us what these tomatoes are for. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I, I, I've got no problem with the amount of tomatoes, unlike that one reviewer. Um, but, you know, here we are then, as I said, right, you know, 10 minutes ago, right back at the start, it was obvious the partner was going to croak it. But surprise, it's just brain damage. So yeah. shut my mouth. Um, it's just, at this point. At this point, it's yeah. It's just brain damage. Um, how convenient, though, that Carice Van Houten just happens to be parking a bike outside while they're discussing it. Yes. To be able to go, hey, what happened to Lars? We? That's yeah. very convenient, but okay, it's yeah, well, but you I'll kind go of go with it. The, the bigger problem I had with with her arrival was for the first five minutes, I was convinced it was um, Vera Farmiga. Oh yeah, okay, I can see how you would confuse the two. Yeah, um, just be, just a lot of her expressions are very similar. Um, her delivery is, is very similar I to think, what. You... I think it's probably because you're so used to seeing Carissa Van Houten as. Uh, Melisandre as well, and this Possibly, isn't yeah. that. And, and, um, yeah, and again, the fact that she's dressed, no, she's dressed in a modern the way. The way she's dressed, that's what I'm saying. It, it yeah. just doesn't look Speaking like... Speaking in a different way, yeah. So, but yeah, for for about five minutes, I was, I was convinced, I know it's not her, but fucking hell, it looks like her. Yeah. And I mean, it sounds I, like her, and... Yeah, I, I, I get what you mean. I had a similar thing with uh, Nicola Castor Walder as well, like, like with the jeans, and like whenever you see him sort of walking as well, and he's in like that jacket and the jeans, and you're like... yeah. He's not moving like Jamie Lannister, and he's not wearing yeah. a coat, and he's not carrying his hand right. And it's As like you say, his arm, his arm grew back. Yeah, so it's so it is a bit weird, but you know, you get you get used to that. Yeah, um, that's it. it was only a couple of minutes, and I was like, right, no, back, no, back into it. Then I was, it was just yeah. one of those. It just it just didn't sit right. Yeah. Um, whereas, so this, whereas it being Norma Bates was absolutely fine. Yeah. So you get you get a, a bunch of bullshit now for a minute or two, like yeah. literal bullshit, and then. We get this um, phone conversation between uh, Karis von Houghton and uh, Nicola Castor-Waldo. I can't remember the character names. Um, he is Christian and she is... Uh... No, I can't remember her fucking name. But they, during this conversation, like she's quite standoffish with him. Um, yeah. But there's this weird... Alex. Fucking... Her name is Alex. Alex. There's this weird fucking slow zoom out that happens on her yeah. coverage. And even having watched the whole film now, I don't know what they're trying to tell us there. Like, first, my, my notes that I'm writing, I write these notes kind of stream of conscious. And my notes that I've written here is, why the zoom out on CVH in the phone scene? It's totally uncalled for. Yeah. Are we being told something here? Is she his daughter? Question mark. Well, that She's was really my first. not his fucking daughter, no. is she? <laughs> well, that, was my, that was my first thing as well. Because, I mean, the, the way it was set up and then there's... Um... A scene later on in the hospital where she walks past the wife. Yeah, yeah. And obviously, there's very clearly something there, and we'll get onto that shortly. But again, you, know, you do get the impression it's you not. Know, there's like a you know, a broken down relationship there. Yeah, but the, but the zoom again with that, you would expect the intensity to amplify. You'd expect yeah. the zoom in. So it's almost like there's some sort of status paradox going on. Except, I don't know. I just couldn't work out. It was very very odd. Um, it, much like the sort of Dutch angle in the apartment, yeah. um, it, it really pulled me out for a second. Um, but then, you know, after that, I, my next note is, is is literally, you know, I get why people might bounce off this, but honestly, for the most part, I think it's pretty successful, which we, we've covered. You know, I, I, I've said that. Um, I, and the reason I've written that now is because there's not actually that much of note happening now for the next hour of the film. There is... <laughs> Well, there's, it's, there's it's, some it's, questionable shit with uh, the shake. Well, I mean, we, yeah, we'll we'll get on to that, but um, it, it kind of it feels like it wants to turn into a procedural for a little bit. Yeah, I was going to say the for me, gets for me, this would have... these two get partnered together and they do some investigation yeah. and like for me, this would have worked better as a as a sort of mini series. Right. Yes, that is literally my closing note. This should have been on TV, yeah. um, because it needs more time to tell this story with with so much yeah. going on. And, and that's what this feels like. It feels like the start of, you know, these two being thrust together. They don't like each other. Yeah, they have for to work together. Yeah, for reasons yeah. we'll come to understand. Um, but we don't spend enough time with that because we're kind of straight over then with this terrorist plot that's going on, which again, in a TV series, working as a B story would be fine. Yes. But it's at odds with our main story, which is one of revenge. And I get that the terrorists are involved because Farouk and killed... Uh, what's his name? Uh, Lars. Lars. No, Lars? so that wasn't Farouk. That was Ezra. Sorry, that was Ezra. Yeah, and they Ezra killed Farouk. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, 
I get what you know it makes sense that that bit adds up but it's just too much when our main story should be about revenging Lars yes um, that's right so you know again the score there are a few quieter scenes here where they're doing some investigation and they're having their phone conversations and stuff like that and you've got this scene with um, Guy Pierce as well at the table and in these quieter scenes yes that score is intrusive like very yes. much so it's not being mixed properly I think is the, yeah, is the it's, real it's, which is, yeah I was going to say it's not the score's fault it's the, it's, it's the mix yeah, and, I mean, and that was one of the things that the Palmer picked up on. He said, "No, I didn't do the mix. I wasn't involved in the ADR. All the shit that is, is wrong with it wasn't me." Yeah, I mean, it, it's flat out ridiculous in that interrogation scene with Guy Pearce. It's absolutely yes. bonkers. It's so over the top, and it really takes away from it. But and other he, than because um, you've got this, it's, it's in two bits, and so the, he's he's in, he's with um, Ezra at the table, and then he goes in to interrogate his son. Yes, and. He starts shouting and banging in the table. And I didn't like. I was watching this last night. Everyone else is in bed, so I, I don't have it on loud anyway. Um, but I, I, for whatever reason, I had my headphones in, and it actually hurt my ears when he yeah. banged at the table. I was like, "Hang on, this is on like fucking fifteen, twenty percent of, of full volume. Yeah, why is this blowing my eardrums?" Yeah, but it's... then the the rest of that scene where he's talking to him, I couldn't fucking hear it. Yeah, it, it's it's very poorly mixed. Um, other than that, though, the the actual dinner table part yeah. of the interrogation is stunning. Again, just it's a fucking perfect scene. You have got the nice practical light in the background. Everybody's framed beautifully. You've got yeah. that nice deep focus with the bodyguard stood in the door as well. Like you could print this fucking thing and hang it on your wall. It looks yeah. stunning. Um, and it, look, it's, it's Guy Pierce. Like, has Guy Pierce ever been bad? Like I don't think he has. I, no. I honestly can't think of a Guy Pierce performance that I don't really like. So I think, I think probably the the most the the most disappointed I've been with Guy Pierce performance is Iron Man three, and that's not a bad performance. Yeah, exactly. No, that that's a so, that's a reasonable performance. Yeah. So again, everything you know, else, he's always fucking stellar. So so nothing to complain about with that. Um, but then we get a weird cut then into the hospital. Yes. And it's jarring as fuck. Like, it's it's so every bizarre. Time, every time you cut to the hospital room, actually, the, the cut doesn't seem to work. Yeah, now, I don't know if they're trying to kind of, if they're trying to upend us, trying to shock us. Yeah, maybe, maybe it's some sort of effort to, to discombobulate. But yeah, every time you go back to the hospital, it's like, hang on, what the fuck have you done there? Why have you done yeah. there? Yeah, it, I don't know. It's just very fucking weird going back to the hospital um now my, my notes are getting i've only got like a page and a bit's worth of notes left because actually oh, yeah. yeah well it's two reasons for that um one is that not a great deal happens if we're honest um but two is that actually even though not a great deal happens this is the first time i've watched this as well um and i'm along for the ride i'm quite enjoying this so i'm not really pulling it apart that much mm. um the next thing i did pick up on though is um when uh, when Ezra goes to the apartment and goes snooping around, yeah, and it starts finding shit everywhere, and then he picks up the gun, yeah, covers it do. in prints, yeah. and then puts it back down, yeah. What the fuck? Yeah, I, I I did think that when he did it, I was like, seriously, they said no, same, and you you, you almost have expected it because earlier on you got the bit where um where Guy Pierce is interrogating the son, and he's now take the knife, pick up the knife, hold it, feel the weight, and thinking you're just putting your fucking prints all over that kid. Yeah, it's... And, it's, and so no, we have that, and then it doesn't come to anything. And then later on, the father is stupid enough to fucking do it on his own. Yeah, it's ridiculous, ridiculous scene. Um, so that yeah, that was really fucking odd. But again, we get we get this beautiful um, get this beautiful setup in in a scene. Prior to this, we get a scene in that apartment where the terrorists are discussing what they're going to do. Yeah, and and the thing with the phone. We yeah, the and we see and we see the and again, you get the fucking. Cut, this, these are one of the cut in the frames you're talking about. Yeah, on, on the USB, the, on the, the cable. Again, it? it's yeah, it's a real stylistic thing. Like, it's very fucking late 60s, early 70s, because, look, then we were splicing fucking film together. That's how we did cuts. You couldn't do a nice, smooth transition. It was super expensive. So you sliced your fucking film together. Um, and that's what that looks like. And again, it feels like a fucking stylistic choice. But actually, it's, again, a very good kind of visual storytelling device of, look, this is important. And then when he yeah. comes back to the apartment, you know, this this is suspense movie making 101. As soon as he walks through the door, you're like, it's the phone leads. The phone leads. Stop looking at the phone leads. Stop looking yeah. everywhere else. There they are. Look at the phone leads. And then yeah. he's going over to the door and you're like, yes, yes, look, it's the yeah. phone leads. 
you're yeah. shouting at the screen and that's the response that they want from you and that yeah that is executed very well it, it is that that works really well the only thing i, I was going to say and again like they 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 throw it away so you know so intently we have the thing with the phones you know make sure you've got that one make sure you, you know and okay. then you open up you've got the drawer full of them and then ezra finds them all because of the lead yeah fine but then no it's no it's you'd expect again if this was done for tv and you're thinking you've given it enough time they would no. it's not just a case of you turn them all on and you look at the numbers because there's passwords and shit like that yeah yeah you, know, you have to break them you have to you know you have to unencrypt them and all this sort of stuff decrypt them fucking hell. Uh, you know you have to do all that sort of stuff so it's not it's not a two-minute process and that yeah. i guess things like that that lend itself to being a longer form narrative it, because it, you know you need things going on while that is happening because then you can use that to to, to break through to the next bit yeah it, whereas it, as it is it's just like Oh right, okay. Well, yeah, we've got all these phones now, so clearly all these phones. Somebody's phoned somebody dodgy from somewhere dodgy, so we'll 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 go for that. Yeah, it de- it definitely belongs in a in a longer format to allow us to unravel all of this stuff slowly, because you know, very next time we see the terrorists, then and we we barely, other than the fact they are terrorists, and we get a lot of fucking talk about Allah and Muhammad and stuff like that, because that's how you signify a terrorist, folks. I don't know if you knew that. Jesus but it's either that or just walk around Christ. saying durka, durka, durka. Yeah, Jesus Christ. I mean, it, it is. Yeah, let's talk about it now because we're about to see a lot of them. Um, yeah. It's fucking disgraceful. Even, yeah. by, like, and even by Hollywood standards. And, and I think this is more kind of, it seems at least like it's more of a Danish production than anything else. But yeah, either but I mean, way, De- Denmark does have a very, disgraceful. Um, Denmark does have a very, laissez fair attitude towards certainly Muslims in as in as far as look, we're not gonna we're not gonna pander and say we can't say this, we can't say that. We'll just no, we'll if if it's there to be said, we'll say it. And this, we had we had the whole thing with the um the, the cartoon didn't you of Mohammed with a yeah, bomb yeah. and it's so, so that no that came out of Denmark. You know, this is something that no as a as as a nation they've they've not shied away from. Yeah, got um, or, or, or as, as a political entity, I say I, I don't. I, I only know one Danish or semi-Danish person, and as far as I know, they're not a horrible racist. They um, don't seem to be. Whoever whoever was involved in the production of this film really? at a high Can't level clearly fucking was. Um, yeah. Um, but Jesus yeah, so, Christ. So, I mean, but it, it does seem to be something that you know, as as a as a country, they, you know, they, the, the hill they're going to die on is look. We can say anything, or we'll say nothing. So we'll say anything. Um, yeah. Which you you can respect to a point, but then you you've still got to do it in a way that's sensitive and nuanced and all the rest of it. Just going out and saying, I know here's here's a random group of Muslims. They must be terrorists, and then they're making jihadi videos. Okay. I mean, I mean, we really double down on that at the end, and I'll talk about the end when yeah. we get to the end. But again, I think if if this were longer form, and honestly, the the easiest TV show to compare this to, and it was the very first thing I thought when I turned it off. Like it it feels like a very condensed version of a season that's what this feels like it, it feels like you know we've reg he's caught in the middle now of this fucking terrorist threat because he's actually started off by just going on some very personal mission and he doesn't want to be here he's the wrong guy in the wrong place at the wrong time yeah it feels very much like 24 by numbers yeah. uh now look 24 isn't exactly a shining example of how to depict terrorism, but they do at least go to great lengths over the course of the 24 episodes to explain why the bad guys are doing what they're doing. There is normally at least a motivation behind it, and they will make some attempt to at least bring you in and understand where they're coming from. Now, ultimately, they're still lunatics who want to blow things up, but... You but kind even, of, and there's normally a personal undercurrent to it. And in in some seasons of Twenty Four, and most we're, we're not reviewing Twenty Four here, but in some in some seasons you do have you no know, your 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 overall villain, your 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 antagonist for the season is a jihadi warrior or is a Russian whatever. Or they 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 set up and and they do go out of their way to do that. But actually, no, one of the the interesting things they do with Twenty Four is actually they set up. We are a diverse society. Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. they're in whether they're in California, they're in Washington or London in the last cities. It's not all about Muslims and black people. You know, you have white terrorists, you have yeah. Asians and Hispanics, and anybody can now anybody can be radicalized. Anybody can have an opinion that differs. Anybody can get to that point where they think, right, enough's a fucking enough. I'm gonna I'm gonna take some action. And that for me was one. No, I say no. Twenty four wasn't overly progressive, but at least it did it did use that to quite a good extent. It's a, it can be anybody and. 
yes, they use it more as a plot device to say, look, it can be the pretty blonde girl over there, or it can be it, it can be somebody working in the in the office who's you no know, blonde hair, blue eyes, and oh no, the, no, it it didn't matter. It was all about the character and all about the story. So they yeah. did they started that way. It kind of tailed off a bit towards the end, but at least you know, you, at least they, they said there was a motivation for it, and it wasn't just every time you see a black person or an Asian person or a Muslim, you know, that was them. It didn't go to that lens. Whereas here, it's just like, okay, well, we're in, we're in a, a white country and there's Muslims, therefore they must be terrorists. And that is exactly how they're depicted here. Um, yes. So, look, that's disgraceful. And I've got, I, honestly, I've got, well, I have got more to say about it when we get to the end, but I'm not going to say any more about it because it's just disgusting. And there's nothing, there's nothing clever or witty that we can try and say about that. The, no. the depiction of Muslims and of, just the, their whole culture in this film is fucking disgraceful. Yeah. I mean, even it's... when you get to the bit where, um, so you have you have that scene um, in the apartment where they do all the stuff with the phones, and then you have a scene where the sheik is off trying, um, and he's not convincing a woman to go off and you know commit an atrocity. It's no, just, no, he's no, telling you're, you're, her. Yeah, you're going to yeah. go off and do this now, and yeah. you know, and it, it's it's all no, it, you're and he's anytime he speaks to anybody, he's always talking about your sacrifice. Yeah. And it's no again. It's very much set up that yes, it's your sacrifice because I wouldn't do it. I'll say I'll yeah. do it because you know, it's it's all in God's interest. But you no, know, Allah's interest. But you're going to do it because I'm going to sit over here and get rich. Yeah, and watch the world burn. It's fucking horrible. Uh, it's horrible. But yeah, speaking of that woman, um, that's the next note I got. I mean, look, there are a lot of logic gaps in this film, and we've talked about some of them already. But the, I mean, this one is ridiculous. How the hell does somebody get on the red carpet? at a film premiere with a fucking machine gun yeah. with a camera attached to it. Yeah. How does that and not, happen? Not only that, because it's not, it's a machine gun. It's not a silenced pistol. No, how, does she go around, how does she get to shoot three or four people while the red carpet event is going on and nobody fucking notices? Well, that's and, the then, and then she, and then she walks out, walks up to the, you know, to the, to the actress who's on the red carpet with a gun, shoots her. points at her all the press then yeah. turns around and shoots people on the steps. Then turns around and points at the, at the press. And it's only when they shoot the act, she shoots the actress or the model or wherever she is at the front. It's only then the press go, "Oh my god, she's got a gun!" It's it's fucking ridiculous. Like like, like yeah, here's, yeah. here's the logic gap of it all, right? Either security or whoever at that event all carry weapons, right? Yeah. Which if they do, the second she fucking opens fire, she's one dead. of them's going to take her out, right? Yeah. Or they don't carry weapons or carry concealed weapons. In which case, walking around with a giant fucking machine gun with a homemade fucking mobile phone broadcasting device on the top of it, like a camera, hmm. is going to raise some fucking eyebrows. Yeah, because it's the sort of thing, even if even if you were making a you know, balls to all action film and this is a publicity stunt, yeah, you tell the security guard so you don't get shot. Yeah, exactly. Like, it makes no fucking sense it, it, whatsoever. It, it makes no sense. And I mean... The other like, um, much like the rest of the terrorist plot. I mean, this well, yeah. this whole terrorist side of the film just does not work for me. It feels like it belongs somewhere else. And like I said, this is where if it was a TV show, you'd be able to run this as your B plot, and it, you would bring it all together towards well, the end. Of the because season. you you would have some reason for that woman yes. to go off and do that. And it it may be that she's known entirely devoted to the cause it may be that she you know that it's she's being coerced it may be that something has happened and she wants revenge because again now that's the theme of the fucking film yep all these things you can work with yep. but no we just get your subservient muslim woman go blow shit up maybe which is what we get she, maybe she just really fucking hates tomatoes which i can vibe with you know yeah. i fucking hate tomatoes too so yeah, but it then again, why, why why align yourself with a terrorist who exclusively, exclusively, exclusively uses them? True. Actually, yeah, true. It would be our heroes who hate the tomatoes, wouldn't it? Yeah. Ignore me. I'm talking shit. My, my brain's starting to dribble out my ears already. Um, So, okay, so there's that, right? That That's just fucking nonsense. Walking the fucking red carpet with a machine gun is, without a shadow of a doubt, one of the most ridiculous fucking scenes we've had to date on this podcast. And bear in mind the fucking films we've watched. We've watched In the Name of the King on here, for fuck's sake. We've watched Mortal Kombat on here, for fuck's sake. And this is one of the most ridiculous scenes that we've ever seen. I just, I yeah. was pissing myself laughing at it. And that should not be the intent of this scene. Well, that, it that's should it, be horrifying. It? Yeah. But it's so fucking implausible mm. and ridiculous. Yeah. And, and again, the problem is, 
uh, aside from the, the logic side of it, we don't give a fuck about any of these characters. It doesn't matter. No, because there are no fucking stakes. Yeah. No, because this is not connected to our heroes at the, all. Like, the, only, the only stakes we have, actually, are for um, Ezra, who yes. is a murderer. Yeah. Well, this is the thing, isn't you know, it? The only person with, any, with anything to lose is this murderer who we're supposed to be rooting against because he killed Jamie Lannister's partner. And again, in a longer form, you can sew that in. You can have him have to work with them and things like that. You can make it more interesting, but we don't have the time to do that instead. like It feels like there's, there's stakes on the Guy Pierce side of things as well because he's trying to stop the terrorists. Okay, There are stakes there. The terrorists are killing people and blowing things up. I understand but even that. Then, but even then, that's not his, his endgame. He wants this guy because he, he, he in an operation he was on years ago, he killed five of his men. It's revenge. Yeah. It's revenge, yeah, true. But then it, there's also the fact that he's blowing stuff up. But yeah, actually, you're right. Yeah. It's not that it, it's it's our it's a good book report again. It's a theme. Yeah, yeah. It, it's not if we don't stop him, he's going to blow up a bowling. Yeah, it's, 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 it's he, he he killed my people. I want him dead. Yeah. Uh, so that and that is actually the 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 core problem with this film. It does lie in the screenplay, and the problem is that there are no stakes. There are none whatsoever. Yeah. Like, yes, there are terrorists. Yes, they're blowing things up, but our heroes are Indiana Jones in this. They're just yeah. along for the ride. Well, that's it. They're, nothing they're doing is having any effect. Yeah, really. and no, the, the fact they're blowing stuff up, they're not blowing up anything where, okay, life is life and all the rest of it, but there's there, there's nothing at stake for in, for Christian or or for Alex. So why why are they going to go all the way to Spain? Yeah. Why are they why are they going to go out of their way to stop this stop a bomb going off in a bullfight? Their families aren't there. Their friends yeah. aren't there. The person they're chasing isn't there. That, that's the thing. It's it's only when we get right to the end and Alex is actually in the arena and sees the bomb that yeah. you go, oh, shit. I've got because issues with that as thinking, well. Well, yeah. But then she's thinking, oh, I'm going to get blowed up. Like, yeah. you know, it it needs they need to be brought into this kind of cat and mouse that's going on a lot earlier yeah. um, or, or at all would help. But. You know, what we've got instead is this fucking revenge thing, which doesn't click with this terrorist plot. So just seeing this stuff is just hilarious because it's so just out of nowhere and so implausible Yeah, that it it, it almost feels like a spoof. Yeah. It, it feels like something from Team America, this. It's, it's fucking terrible. Um, then we get, you mentioned it earlier, but then we get that weird fucking scene in the hospital mm. with Chris Van Houten where she walks past the wife yeah, and gets recognised, and the and and it's it, it's clear from that point what the relationship is between the two of them. Like they, they they're frosty as hell, yeah. um, but then to flip that on its head, she kind of mentions that maybe there was still something going on, but the wife in that case didn't see. It. It's all very confused. Like yeah. they clearly were fucking, and I think. I think the intent is that they now aren't, and he's decided to stay with his wife. But then she's not over him. Maybe I don't know. It's it's really the way it's kind of set up is. I mean, you get the sort of the classic bit where we get the reveal later on. So we had this scene, and then we get this thing about you no, know, they were they were in a relationship. He was going to leave his wife, all this sort of stuff, and we get you no, know, we we had earlier on where um, right back to the beginning where they're all having dinner and you know she, she's talking about go, them going on holiday and you no, know, and Lars is reluctant and all this sort of stuff. So. They've they've done some groundwork there. There's, clear, there's clearly tension there. There's clearly a problem there. But then, because it's because we never get any with it. And again, I think that this is where it would benefit from a longer form is that we get this this lack of interaction between the two. They lock eyes and kind of walk. You know, they, and so at that point, we're saying, well, the wife knows who she is, and is like, what the fuck are you doing here? Or she doesn't know who she is. In which case, what is that response for? Yeah, but if she knows who she is, then why no? Why, why is Alex convinced that he is going to leave Hannah and go and set up shop with their new family, while Hannah's booking a fucking holiday? Yeah, something it's, doesn't something doesn't something work. Something doesn't has add to up. Give. No. Again, there's, 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 there's too many pieces, sides to it. There's pieces of the puzzle missing that I feel like probably the writer knows what they are, and and whether it's been shot and it's just ended up on the cutting room floor, or whether. You know, this is something you would see more in long form. I don't know, but there's definitely bits missing. Yeah, um, and I think that's. <coughs> excuse me, I think that's the thing. Is that there's certain. Um, it's all right saying the writer probably knows, mm. but the writer's not on screen doing the work. <coughs> yeah, 
So yeah, so you know, you know, it's you get to that point thinking, well, okay, well, either it's important or it's not. But if it's not important, don't put it in. Yeah. Or don't put half of it in. And again, you've got to come back to we don't know. No, we don't know what was written. We don't know what was shot. We don't know what was put in the original edit. But at some point, some somebody who's looking at your edit from a continuity point of view should be going, hang on, what's happening there? And again, yeah. I think this is the benefit, and um, so it's the benefit of having external edit- editors uh, who who aren't your directors, aren't your producers. But you can say, look, here's here's my bible, here's my script, here's my storyboards, here's my markups, all the rest of it. Here's the footage, put yeah. it together. Because that yeah. way, that if something doesn't work, they're going to say, you. Is there something missing from that? Have I missed a bit? Because that doesn't follow that. That doesn't work. Or that doesn't lead into that. And I don't think they've got that here because for whatever reason, they jump all over the fucking place and nobody seems to care. No, no, they don't. That that's the problem, is there's all of these fucking disparate stories that are just thrown together. Um but the problem is that like the terrorist one aside, if we there's three stories basically. Yeah. There's there's the vengeance for whatever his name was. Lars. Um, Lars. Then there's Guy Pierce's vengeance kick. Uh, and then there's the fucking terrorists. And yeah. it's the terrorist side of it that, that doesn't work. The other two pieces sort of fit together. But yeah. throwing the terrorists in doesn't work. And then there's all of these disparate bits that don't quite come together. But on their own, each of them I really enjoy, aside from the terrorist one. Yeah. But uh, that's, that's the thing. And they... they... <laughs> It's alluded to at the end that, that when um, and we're, we're sort of, but without going into too much detail, Guy Pierce says, "I can use this guy." Yeah, surely it's a far better it's a far better thing that if you want you can do away with the whole terrorist angle, and you say, right, we start off with as as we go, there's a domestic disturbance that Lars and Christian go to. Lars ends up getting stabbed in the neck. They escape, but fine. So your A plot is Christian and Alex are chasing down the killer. Yeah, because they want revenge. Guy Pierce is using him as an assassin for the CIA. Yep. Yeah. So the more no, the more and more they follow him, the more and more they get into these cases. The more and the more, the, the higher the body count gets. And then they and uncover then, a terrorist plot. Yeah. E- even if you don't have the terrorist plot, even if you say right, okay, e- no, even rather than having terrorists and using Ezra to find the terrorist because Guy Pierce wants revenge, he's using him as a, as a as a, 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 a as an asset effectively. And yeah. they and they're they're chasing down and as no, the the plot they uncover isn't terrorists it's Guy Pierce. Yeah, that's so what I'm saying. So, but they they uncover this what they think yeah. is a terrorist plot, yeah. but so it's all being really dressed up by the CIA. Yeah. So then yeah. you have you can have your showdown at the end. Yeah. And it'll work far better, and you don't have to have the really 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 horrible bits in the middle. You've just instantly improved this film a million percent, Mark. That's the film I want this to be. And that's the film that it almost is, if you mm. take that fucking ridiculous terrorist plot out of it. Um, but, you know, it saved me about 20 minutes as well. I mean, I yeah. didn't start this till after the football last night. I didn't put it on to fucking half 11. Jesus. I mean, I, by the time, I watched by the time it, you finished, I was dead. I watched it at like five o'clock in the afternoon. So I, I was fine. I, 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 had a, I just breezed straight through it. Um, so then we get my second favorite line. In the, in the whole fucking film. My favourite comes right at the end, but my second favourite line in the whole fucking film, when they walk up to the airline counter and ask for two tickets to Spain. Yeah. Anywhere in Spain. Yeah, because Spain is tiny. Yeah. Well, I mean, first of all, they do ask for, I think it's Malaga, and they just says, we haven't got any flights to Malaga. It's so a, then they a, just go... Error, isn't that? Yeah, so then you just go, well, anywhere in Spain then. We don't yeah. we don't care, just anywhere in Spain. Yeah, we're, we're not on a clock, it's fine. Now, again, no stakes. It's not like, oh, my God, if you drop us there, then fucking hell, we've only got 12 hours to get to the ball ring and stop the bomb going off. This stuff writes itself. Yeah. But they don't go for that, you know. Um, and <laughs> there's also the whole the whole going through security thing as well, where they've got yeah. the gun again. And he's like, we're police officers. I'll fill a form in. And she's like, no, forget it. It's yeah, it's Brussels. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's Brussels. Brussels it? Yeah, and but the thing is, right? Okay, you you could say fine. Okay, well, there will be protocols for that because even if no, even if they're allowed to take, oh, even if they're right, you can't take them. You know, your police officers. You no, know, we can fill the forms in. You can't take them into the fucking cabin with you, but yeah. we we can lock them in the cockpit. Yeah, where well, you I mean, can't get to them. You know, at this point, it's 
probably best to take his fucking gun off him anyway because he clearly can't be trusted. I was going to say, yeah, he's, he's going to confuse it with the remote control, isn't he? Or yeah. He's going he's, he's, he's to think it's his headphones and blow his fucking brains out. Yeah, I mean, you know, he's fucking two steps away from Cluzo, isn't he? Let's be fair. Um, <laughs> he's, he's about as inept as it could possibly be. It's a good job he's really, really good looking, really, isn't it? Um, so then they go and drive about Spain a bit. They get into a fight. They're like in this... This crap little fight scene that they have outside the car, which looks awkward as all hell. Well, the fight I was going to say, it's, it's really, the it's really funny because you get the they have, they have the argument on the plane, which is just again, it's just so comically the, the, the dialogue is so comically bad. Yeah, uh, but, but oh then, no, well then, you know, he's, again, he's what, gone back to his wife, and you you're still young, you'll move on, you meet, and, she, and she's like, fuck you, and she's like, fuck you, you fucking asshole. I was like, okay, that's not really the. It's not the line to go to her with, and it's not that's not the comeback either. It's just like, oh, we, we need something to put a bit of tension between them. Let's do that. Fuck it. It'll be fine. But, Nobody will but care. Yeah, it, it's a bad line, but I think it's actually played very well. And again, you know, in terms of visual storytelling, again, I think that, you know, what, what we get left with them, we're left with him scrolling through the phone, and he sees how happy they are, and then he comes across the baby photo. All really well done. You know, mm-hmm. we don't have to have the bombshell of, oh, and by the way, I'm fucking pregnant. Or, yeah. they, you know, they don't have a... Which, you know, let's be fair, this would be the traditional dick move from a writer, either throwing up somewhere or something yeah. like that. You know, she does mention, we'll come on to it because I want to talk about the scene, but she does mention she's going to be sick, but it's not to do with the pregnancy. You know, yeah. she's just, it's, so having him just thumb through it on the phone and then his, I think his reaction shot to that is very good as well. So again, I, I think that is handled really well. And that's an interesting element to the story. It adds a lot to her character. And yeah. actually from this point out, she is the best thing about this film. Yeah, like she's she's done nothing up to this point really, but from yeah. here out, again, it's like there's this weird intermediary bit of a character arc that we haven't seen, but from here on out now, she's fucking incredible for the rest well, this, of the film. She's this is absolutely it. I mean, awesome. All we've had, I mean, all we've had of her so far as well is she seems she she seems like a bureaucrat cop. Where no, she's all about yeah. paperwork. I, I want to say she's like internal affairs or something like that. She's not. No, she's yeah, not like it's out never in the really field and stuff. Explained, is it? What but she in which, is. yeah. So I mean, the fact that she's chasing down a murderer now with a gun is probably a little bit off. Yeah. But fine, I can live with that. Um, and you, you know, you, the thing with her throwing up is when uh, Hannah tells them that Lars has died. So we get we get so the we, car scene. So let, let's let's scene, yeah. let's talk about that because for my money, and all right, we're in a pandemic year, so I've not I've not been to the cinema much. Um. But for my money, this is probably the best scene I've seen on film all year. It's fucking, score aside, mm. what a fucking scene this is. This and the one after it, the score is terrible because it gets in the way again. But the performances from the two of them here are just absolutely stellar. Like, yeah. it's, there is no way to predict how anybody is going to react to receiving information like that. Yeah. And I think what they do very well here is just capture the just the horrible uncertainty of that. You can feel it. You, it yeah. and, and that's when you know we get a good performance. You, know, you can feel how uncomfortable they are. And then she's instantly like, I'm going to be sick. He doesn't know what to say he just to the point where he just wants to get off the phone. He just is, you know, and, and it seems ridiculous. But it's the type of thing that happens of like, OK, well, I'll talk to you tomorrow because What's he gonna say to her? Yeah, like what, what what's can he gonna he change? Possibly say. Yeah, and it, and it's it's just that feeling where you know it's a feeling I know unfortunately all too well where just all the air is just sucked out of you and you're just yeah. like I yeah. I don't know what to do I, and you don't yeah. you know and, and then and then you get the scene after the after it as well where they they have it out where she's off being sick and they're outside the car yeah it, it's fucking incredible the performances from the two of them are just absolutely superb I, I don't care what anybody says about the rest of the film i defy anybody to yeah. pick fault in this other than the score which is atrocious and steps on the point massively yeah. because it's too loud yeah um, we, we covered that earlier on yeah but it, it's an absolutely phenomenal scene like even even if the rest of the film was at the horse shit I, I think it's not that bad. No, it's, no, it's not. It, it's not that bad. If it was at the horse shit, I would still be singing the praises of of these these two scenes back to back. They're fucking phenomenal. Um, and it, so then, just when you think actually, it, it feels like we're getting into something. It feels like all of a sudden there's meat on the bones of this story because we're starting to understand these characters, and certainly yeah. for her, we're understanding the motivation behind her revenge and stuff, and, and we're realizing that actually, 
yes, Nicola Castellwall's character is, has brought us into the world and he's our traditional hero, but actually, no, this it's all about her. Like she she yeah. from this point on, she just goes full Clary Starling from this point on. Yeah. It's, it's all about her. She all of a sudden she's a field agent just kicking ass. I was like, gonna say it's it's interesting when we get to um when we get to sort of the, the last couple of scenes where she's in the arena and, and he's not. Fucking, she, look, I want more of her doing that. Not yeah. not just in this film. I'll put good money down tomorrow. You give me another film now with Karis Van Houten basically doing a doing an FBI agent kind of thing. Give me give me fucking something Silence of the Lambsy with yeah. her in the, in the Clary Starling. I'm I'll take it all fucking day long. I think she's superb when we get to the, like once we get to the end where we're in the ball ring. Yeah, and like like I said, that's the only point. There's any real stakes, and you can see her piecing all together and chasing people down. And it, yeah, she's great, 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 great. And like I say, I, I come to this from a point of liking both of these anyway. So I'm probably an easy mark, but I think she's excellent at the end. But before we get there, yeah, we get, <laughs> we get this scene where he's, uh, where Ezra's staking out the kebab shop. Yeah. And again, the score, there's this orchestra stab where he's just, yes. just kebab shop. Ta-da! It's <laughs> like, Jesus Christ. Yeah. Again, talk about the whole cultural representation of it it's like it's clearly the kebab shop from hell from yeah. his orchestra stand but again. in all fairness once he gets in there um so we you know we get the bit where he goes in and he's he's, he's talking to the the owner um and the, the guy's trying to get him to leave and then so we have all that so then he, he shuts the doors pulls the the, the blinds and all the rest of it, and he's, he's torturing him right so he the, the the insinuation is that he's he's pushing his face into a vat of boiling oil it's mm-hmm. there it's boiling Except, no. except you can actually see the hole in the table with yep. the red lamp underneath it. So there's that. Yeah. But also, uh, and I'm going back to a very early episode of Spooks where they did the same to Lisa Faulkner. Yeah. Now they shoved her head in a in a deep fat fryer, and she was dead in seconds. Yep. This motherfucker went in and out of it about five times, and his skin came out unblemished. Yeah. But, but the oil was bubbling, so it must have been boiling. Yeah, I mean, How maybe he's, resist- he's resistant to fire damage, clearly. Um, <laughs> gotta be. Um, I, uh, fucking hell, I don't know. I, I wasn't even questioning it by this, but I was I was honestly more concerned with the fact I could see the lights underneath the table. I was just like, that's yeah. really fucking poor. That's yeah, the, really poor. That's like they've gone, oh, shit, are we doing this? We're filming that today. I thought that was next week. Oh, fuck, we haven't got the table for that. We haven't got the right thing yet. Yeah. Oh, fuck it, we'll, we'll make something up. Yeah. I mean, just crop the fucking shot for Christ's sake. Oh yeah, exactly. You know, we live in a digital age now. Um, but yeah, like fine, whatever. We get the interrogation scene, the crab shop. Great, decent enough fucking scene as well. The yeah. crab shop's fine. You know, again, set up well. You get the roaming camera in there, and he's closing the blinds. And problem is, he's completely unlikable as a character, isn't he? Like, he's piling this whole thing up again, where he's like, "I have to do this because I, they will kill my family and what have you, and I need to." Yeah, Whereas, yeah but they but, haven't done the work. You're a killer. <laughs> Why do I care about you? I don't give a shit about we, you. And we can have that. We can, no, we can have the, sort of the Leon gross point blank aspect where, yes, we do care about this this killer, but we need to do the work first. We need to have something, you know, we need to understand why he's doing what he's doing. We have a throwaway comment about his uncle or his cousin or something right at the start. Again, it's and so then it, easy. It just, that it melts into, oh, we, by the way, we've got your family. It's it's so easy. You just make him a contract killer with a child to support. Yeah. Like you say, you go Leon on this thing. It's easy, and then yeah. all of a sudden he's sympathetic. It's fucking easy. Yeah, um, as it is. I mean, they, they try it very like really early on. They talk about he, the the shade killed his uncle or his cousin or something. Um. So we get we have that. They throw that away, and then we introduce Guy Pierce having his family, and then that's. N- Again, that's never really explored. Again, yeah. we have a cu- we have a couple of shots of them in a in a room, and that's most no, that's that's what's motivating him. But surely, you no, know, Guy Pierce needs to be turning up the pressure a little bit. I'm just just turning those screws and going, tick tock, yeah. motherfucker. Again, stakes. Yeah, stakes. Uh, that's what's missing, you know. And and then you know we do after this then get the chic laying out his, his grand plan basically, laying out our, our act three of I'm going to blow up a fucking bull ring with this drone. As you do. As you do. But again, like, the big problem is but, he's such a paper thin villain. Like, he's yeah. just this generic terrorist. But he's got no we don't understand, other than he's a terrorist, which isn't acceptable. 
We don't understand why he's doing what he's doing. So there's no yeah. buy-in here. There's no there's no stakes at well, all. Well, this, this is it. And I mean, um, so we talked about 24 earlier on. Um, the other thing I was going to compare it to was um, Jack Ryan on Amazon. Not um, watched it, but I, based, I know based on Jack Ryan, books, obviously. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, based on Sam Clancy books. Very good series. And again, like the first season was better than the second, but built around the world of... Um, Right, uh, radical extreme, extreme uh, religious, religious terrorism. Fine, it's done, handled a lot better than this. But again, the your main terrorist has a family, mm. and he has a, no. There's a son who wants to defect to the West. Effectively, you know, there's yeah. there are stakes involved. There's no, there's stuff for the character to deal with. It's not just Allah is good, Allah is great, blow fucker and shut no, blow stuff up. Yeah. That's no, that, that's what's missing here because again, no, yeah, and yes, okay, you do have radicals, you do have fanatics, and no, they, no, they want to do things because they think it will advance the cause that they're supporting. But you need to explore that. It's not just, oh well, I'm a Muslim, therefore I'm a terrorist, therefore I want to watch the world burn. You can't I mean, do that. No, I, I mean, again, it, you know, I only watched the first two seasons of it, but there's the obvious comparison to Homeland as well. But yeah. that's where you, where you peel back the layers of, you know, what what makes a terrorist? How how do they get radicalized? What? Yeah. What is it, you know? Um, and, and that's the piece that, even if you're not going to have that, then we at least need to understand why the sheep wants to blow up this bull. Why this one? Why, yeah. like, and, and I know it's terrorism, so it's seemingly random acts of violence, I know. But that doesn't work in the purpose of a short narrative like this. We no, need to know right. why. Why yeah. this one? And preferably, it should have some sort of tie back to something that's gone on somewhere else yeah exactly so that and, got... and this, is what, this is what we we're talking about earlier on that there needs to be there needs to be some sort of stake involved whereby so we've chosen this one because i don't know the the president of a, a munitions factory yes. that built bombs that blew up my my homeland some, give it something to no, give it something yes. to hang on this num no, this is a, no, a random a, it's a random act and yes unfortunately in in life ter- no, we do there are terrorist attacks on random things no, because that's not that's how they work you you the security at uh, I don't know, an international football match is far greater than cockfights done behind the local bar. Yeah. yeah. The effect is the same. You blow you blow people up, but yeah. you, you know, it's gonna be a lot easier to do one than the other. But this just seems to be like, oh yeah, well we, yeah, fuck it, they'll do that. It's 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 a bit um, like we talk about we used to talk about on Game of Thrones quite a uh, Game of Thrones quite a lot. It's shock and awe. It's go for the biggest thing, most sensational thing we can do. And we're now introducing stakes because all of a sudden, if we don't stop these terrorists, they're going to kill all the people in this in this arena. Yeah. So finally, there are stakes. Except we don't know where any of them are. We don't. We don't really believe the threat is credible because we've not seen anything of the terrorists, mm. apart from they're really good at causing distractions. Apparently. Yeah. Um, and again, no security one hundred and one. If two people start fighting outside your front door, somebody hangs back and stands on, on the front door. See who else is going to try and yeah. leg it in. Yeah, but I mean, um, before we get into that, before we get into taking down the, the final scene, like, we have to talk about, again, the, the sheer random convenience of them driving down the road and going, I recognise that tomato symbol. Yeah. Oh, my God, it's the Sheik. It's him. And then all of a sudden they follow. It's him who we haven't really been looking for this whole time. Yeah, we, we know nothing about. We've just about. been tangentially affected by him. But not only really that. But right. there he is. So they drive past, and they're both driving past like this. Yeah. But also, the three fuckers in the van are going, who the fuck are they? Yeah. They they, they lock eyes. And, and then, then no, they allow them and, to follow them. Yeah, and then they think nothing more of it. And they don't notice her doing a UE in the middle of the road. And then follow yeah. them for the next four hours. Yeah, ridiculous. Ridiculous. But then, yeah, they follow them to the bullring. Yeah. We decide we're going to divide and conquer. So yeah, that uh, works. I'm, I'm, I'm Tarish, on board with that. Tarish Van Houten slips in, you know, when the when the distraction happens, and uh, Nicola Castle Walder decides to go into the opposing building and just go full on Nathan Drake video game stealth takedown on someone. Yes. It's like it's, it's incredibly ex- well executed. Like somebody has clearly watched or played too much Uncharted and gone, that's how we're going to take somebody yeah. out stealth style. I want uh, at least one of those. Yeah, I want to do that. Just get him around the head, fucking yeah. get him in a headlock, choke him out. So that was fine. The one thing that, I, that did bug me was, so when um, when we go into the bullfighting arena and we're, we're then watching it, so we're watching the terrorist get himself in, so we're watching two terrorists. So one we know has fake cans full of explosives. Right, and that, another one has, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So and the other one has a backpack. He walks in. Yeah. 
sits puts down, the backpack down, puts yeah. the backpack down, gets up and cat. No, he's there for a couple of minutes, then he casually walks away. Now I'm not being funny. He could quite easily be going for a piss at that point. Why are the police all over him straight away? There's been yeah. nothing to suggest that there's any problem with him whatsoever. No. Now we've just had this point where Caster Walter said to um, Van Houten that they're causing a distraction. Duh! Yeah. What the fuck is this? Yeah. It's a distraction. It's a distraction. Yeah. So but we then... get that. So then we get you no, know, we get this of so the shakes eye view then of all this kicking off through the binoculars and all that stuff. So and that works really well. Apart from the fact that let's say there's nothing to tip off the police that actually there's a bomb in this bag, or that he's doing anything whatsoever. No. So that that relies on too much assumption. Again, that relies on the fact that well, he's a Muslim. He must be a terrorist. We need to stop him. Yeah, I mean that's clearly what it is, isn't it? He's a Muslim and he's left the bag there. Yeah. Um, so clearly, clearly it's a bomb. So we I, get that, and yeah. then so she she's then caught up in that and then spots the other dude with the cans right now she's followed in here's, here's the big problem and, and again i just want to say that this scene is very very well executed yeah i don't get me wrong the, the, the like, again the tension the pacing yeah, it's all really it's good excellent it's I the really writing it's this fucking bollocks. Yeah, it is it is the writing of it so um so we've got right we're evacuating one half or one quarter of the bull ring and people on the next tier over decide that they want to fucking drink not that not oh maybe we ought to leave yeah maybe no. there's something going on over there let's get a drink and then when the guy that's about to sell you the drink gets incredibly aggressive and starts shoving you off but not the... only that it's it starts off with two teenage girls who he physically pushes away yeah like no, how sorry, is he that's not, not gonna instant... fucking fly no how is he not instantly ejected from the arena yeah. Like, and again, you no know, things like you no know, ID passes and stuff like that, you know, to get you into the security, you know, licenses for selling shit, all this sort yeah, of stuff. Yeah. But no, I'll just walk in with some, with some, with with a you know, couple of uh, couple of tins of pop. Yeah, and it's, it fight with these two teenage girls and this old guy as well. Yeah, who doesn't like the fact that I've just shoved these two teenage girls? No, which, quite, I, I, right, no, quite frankly, yeah, yeah. good on you. But well. but again, like the you know, the escalation of that is ridiculous. Yeah. Like, uh, but it, point... but again, it's not an altercation. There's not an argument. There's not a fight. He just tries to shove this bloke away as well. Yeah. No, so, no, I, I could work out right. So we get so at this point we see that the drone is coming over really slowly and it's got and they told him wait for the red light. Now, what are they? What are they doing? Is that a case of the red light indicates there's a camera on, so we're broadcasting, or is yes. the red light some yeah, yeah, yeah. signal relay that actually the, the 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 button I've got in my hand over on the fucking building, it needs a link to blow you up. I didn't get what the fuck was going on there at all. I, I was I was on the understanding that red light comes on so that you can say your piece because he does, doesn't he? The red light comes on, he yeah. says his piece to camera, and then. <laughs> but but and that then... was that was the thing first off. I was wondering what they were doing because then this whole no, again this this whole thing of. We don't see cameras. And we had the bit earlier on where they they were doing the the bit of the red carpet. There's your camera. There's this. There's that. And we get we get a narration over it. No, he's directing traffic. Yeah, we don't yeah. get anything here. It's just yeah. When the red light comes on, shit, blow yourself shit up. down. Yeah. Um, so again, again it's just, it doesn't fit with what we've seen of the char- of of the shape character before now, whereby you know, you know, he, he likes to fucking audience. He you know he wants people to know what what they're doing. Yeah, so and it, it just doesn't work. No, but it, they put this device in there basically so that we can see the drone come slowly down to the bullring. Again, nobody going, what the fuck is that? Yeah. What the fuck is that? A- apart from Chris Van Houten who's watching it going, that shouldn't be there, but still continues to watch it until yeah. such a point the red light comes on and then she goes, oh, fuck, it's a bomb. However, I'm going to let that fly because what she does next is fucking <laughs> immense. Like... <laughs> Yes. Now, now in 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 any other film, she would probably pull a gun out and shoot him in the head, yeah. or she. But we've already established she doesn't have a gun. Yeah, she doesn't have a gun, or she'd go in for some sort of, you know, some sort, sort of swift know, shoot or takedown, yeah. or yeah, yeah, no, full on nut shot. Yeah, that, love her. Yeah, absolutely and, love and, her. And again, that. it's quite funny though, because normally you get the bit where it's it's very, <laughs> it's very staged, and it's no, very, I'm gonna no, I'm a direct in front of you and i'm going to throw my knee up and catch you in the box no this is no. a full on roadhouse kick straight in the pills yeah it, it's fucking incredible it is we we've talked um many many times on, on this show fact about how much we like these kind of almost real fights these kind of yeah. unstaged down and dirty fights and it's exactly that like in a real life situation you feel like that's what a normal kind of untrained person really would do yeah. just like i I think I can kick him in the nuts and stop this. Fuck yeah. it. <laughs> if I kick him in the nuts, he's going to lose his concentration. And, and it, else. It's the first thing you're going to do, right? If yeah. you're if 
if you're in an unarmed situation like this, I don't care who you are, I don't care how how clever you think you are, how big and hard you think you are, if you don't have any form of martial arts or fighting training whatsoever, if kick you're put in a nuts. combat situation like that, the first thing you're going to do is kick somebody in the gonads. It's, it, that is what you're going to do. Yeah. It's, it's simple, isn't it? it it's going to be a, a quick shot to the nads. Down yeah. he goes. I fucking love that she managed to save the world from a terrorist plot by kicking a guy in the nuts. I think that's incredible. And I so think that, she that executes it and so I, well as well. Like you she say, had the, that, and then I can't throws remember. a weight behind it and everything. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a proper roadhouse kick straight in the balls. I mean, yeah. the thing I don't, I can't remember then, because it was quite late by the time I got to this point, but the, so how do they lose control of the drone to a point where, yeah, uh, Castle kill and then he loses yeah. control of it and then it flies and decapitates him which i thought yeah. was fucking hilarious yeah this, this i mean that would spread out a brain dead yeah yeah and again great. works really well the, the, you've got the tension you've got the cutting the intercutting between the two uh the two in, incursions um you get the let's say the death the the, the the stealth death then no then he um the, then he, he kills the pilot and the, no, the pilot loses control of the drone and then just, you know, goes straight into the guy's neck i mean that that's straight out of fucking brain dead with yeah. the lawnmower yeah, and yeah. It works perfectly. Um, it made me laugh more than it should have because it doesn't belong in this film. No, it really doesn't. Um, but yeah, it worked and it was fun and it was fine. And then, oh, at that point, everybody then goes, oh, shit, sure, no, and yeah. runs away. And, and at which point, I, I did think it was amazing, actually, that she had the, the, the presence of forethought to put her headphones in so she could hear him on the phone. Yeah. So who fucking does that? But like, is it, we, we've kind of established at this point now for this this last third of the film that is her character. She actually is just kicking ass and taking names. She's just like, look, I'm not fucking around anymore. Like, I, I'm fed up with this shit now. I'm just going to take the fucking terrorists out. I'm going to kick him in the nuts. This is entirely business. Your piece back in, right? Where are you? Do you need my help? Because you're so fucking useless, basically, is what this yeah. is. Like, where are you? And then he goes, look up to the building. So, like, yeah, okay. She goes up there. Um, and then we get this wrap up on the rooftop, which is just incredibly swift very well, very talky and entirely unsatisfying because... well this is, this is my problem with it so the, the the pacing on the first act was good the second act's pacing was okay but they felt like there were bits missing and it could have been longer this third act is non-existent it's the zach Amiri problem again yeah it is exactly and it's because the work isn't in the second act it's because we haven't had any escalation of threat it's because these stories haven't collided before now so yeah. none of them know who the other one is there's just this mass confusion on the rooftop of like well i want him dead but he's valuable to me but i can't kill you and we're actually on the same side aren't we so yeah I think, so it's all it, it's just a mess that they they do their best to wrap up um saved entirely um by karis van houten again uh just her no bullshit attitude to the whole yeah. thing where they're arguing about we can't kill him i need him I blah, 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 and she just flat out Ice is the guy. Yeah, just murders him. Pops him in cold blood. Like brilliant. She is amazing. Um, and then like cherry on top, best line of the film, without a shadow of a doubt, from Guy Pierce. We're Americans. We read your fucking emails. <laughs> <laughs> brilliant. Yeah. So that that was um, that was fine. Um, I said, pro again, the problem I had with the end, aside from the fact it's so quick, so swift. Consequences. She right. just. Yeah. She broke jurisdiction. She left the country where she's allowed to shoot people. Yeah. Managed to get a gun and shot some shot somebody who was no threat, who was not armed, was not doing any fucking thing, and shot him in cold blood. She has to pay for that. I that doesn't bother me so much because that feels like that's that's just a coda to this. She's got she needed to kill the guy because he killed the man she loved. She did it. I'm not worried about what the consequences of that are. Um well, it's just the fact that everybody walks away and I'm just like, hang on, there's yeah, nobody, that, nobody that doesn't, cares. Yeah, no, that doesn't no, that that doesn't that that doesn't bother me. That that's our end, you know. The fact it, it wasn't there was nothing to wrap up is the problem. They just had to tie all these loose threads together. There was no grand interconnected plan tying everybody together, so it doesn't feel satisfying. Uh, what I do hate about the end is that in lieu of that, they've clearly got to the end and gone, well, that meandered to an awkward finish with the two of them embracing on a rooftop, even though they kind of hate each other a bit, yeah. and he's now he's sort of fucking his dead partner's girlfriend if we put them together. So we can't do that. So I don't know what we're gonna do. Maybe they're just friends, and that's okay. With it. I, I like, I actually like where their yeah. relationship ends. But it, again, it's just kind of meandered to that point because we haven't seen the transgression. It's gone yeah. from I fucking hate you to we have to work together to end this terrorist threat in like ten seconds flat. Yeah. Um, so in lieu of that, what they do is frame it around the terrorism 
uh, and give us this little yes. coda piece where we flash back the, and and it's almost like they're trying to tell us something and i think yeah. what they're trying to tell us is terrorism is really bad and muslims should be watched basically yeah. and i'm not okay with that it's no, horrible I, framing the film with that it, it is and i think the other problem with it is that it, it kind of it sets us up for there's more shit to come yes yeah again this uh, almost even, feels like even though everybody's to... dead even yeah. though no girl in the video blew herself up the shake is dead the drone pilot is dead the other guy with you know with the uh the drone is dead all that's no all that's done but it sets up it, it says actually we could do a sequel of this tomorrow with just you no know, insert, insert more terrorists here yeah, it, it kind of feels like they want to carry these two characters on, doesn't it? Almost yeah. like they want a franchise here of, like, they're going to go on now to, like, chase down all of the Sheik's connected networks with Guy Pierce and stuff like that. It, it feels like it wants to go down that road, something like a Jack Ryan kind yeah. of. and again, um, long-form narrative. Yes, yeah, and, and it's a shame, actually, because, you know, in a long-form narrative and with some more intelligent writing around those terrorists... Um, I I would be up for that because these two leads I I like a great fucking deal yeah. I really do and it, it like I say um, Karis von Houten especially towards the end what she ends up as she's fucking incredible I'd watch more of her tomorrow like I want to see her in more action films now uh, mm-hmm. someone should fucking cast her um, but look in in summation like then I don't think this is all that bad it's distasteful. To yeah. the point of sickening in places, if I'm honest. Uh, yeah. And I, I'm not excusing that. You know, I've called it out for that as well. Um, but it is entirely solid. Like, there's too much going on and none of it really gels. But also, none of it is, like, glaringly bad. You know, none of it is, like, this is unforgivable. Aside from, as I say, the distastefulness of the terrorists. Like, it yeah. all just about hangs together and that's credit to De Palma yes um it's actually very good in places it's it's solid you know it's a solid five out of ten I think four five out of ten in general but in places some of those scenes are absolutely phenomenal the performances are great Carice von Houten is just oh god I love her I, I just want more of her doing this um the problem is that there is no fucking act three. So it's in, you left feeling entirely unsatisfied. But up until yeah. that point, like this is 90 minutes and I was along for the ride. I was expecting this to be a slog from everything we've read. And yeah. I breezed through this. Uh, like I said, I, I think part of it is dialing into that tone. And actually, like there's, there's the 60s, 70s thriller aspect of it. But there's also, you, you mentioned it earlier on, there's that kind of straight to video, almost kind of death wish kind yeah. of thriller vibe to it, which is there's a little bit of nostalgia there for me as well. This is the type of shit that me and my dad would get from the video shop for like yeah. 99p. Yeah, with, 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 with me no and big name stars or anything. Yeah. This is just here's just murder by numbers. Somebody's partner's dead, and here's a cop with yeah. nothing to lose out to find the killer. Like it feels like that you know and, yeah wonky wooden sets and, sh- and all you know it's you, as we said some of those sets are so small that they can't shoot around them properly you know some of it looks incredibly cheap and it just felt like that and meeting it on that level i was okay with it and meeting it on the level of this is a hitchcock pastiche i was okay with it because it's very well done so i think mm. actually this is a bit of a marmite film it's, it's definitely not good it's never going to be anyone's favorite film and it yeah. definitely has problems but I think whether this is like a one out of ten or a kind of five six out of ten, I'd, it I'd, is I'd, I'd say it's a solid. To... I'd say it's a solid six. Yeah, I, um, I think it's solid. I, I definitely think it's solid. I wouldn't watch it again. I've got no desire to ever watch it again. <laughs> but I'm not. I'm not sorry that I have. And I can say no. that for literally hundreds of films of its ilk that I've sat through and gone, yeah, that was all right. That killed ninety minutes. Fine. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm I'm largely the same. I mean, I well, as a we, we we found this but kind of by accident last week um wasn't i wasn't overly concerned i thought i mean th- this type of film i said there's so many films of its ilk where you can think well it's mindless can no it, it's candy floss for the brain you can just sit there and absorb it for 90 minutes and it's not going to change your life but at the same time it's going to pass some time 
Yeah. And that's kind of where I was. I, I, I watched the football last night, which went to fucking penalties. So there was an extra like 45 minutes on when it should have finished. And by the time I started, it was gone 11. And I'm still thinking, fuck it, I'm, I'm going to put it on because it's not going to kill me. And if I fall asleep, I can watch it today instead. Not a problem. Yeah. And I was going, I was getting there. And I was starting to get a bit tired. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll see how much is left. Because if it's no, if it's a while, I'll go back to tomorrow. And there were 12 minutes left. And at Jesus. that point, I'm thinking, right, okay, A, I've invested over an hour without realizing. So it's yeah. not, clearly it's not a drudge. Yeah. But also, how the fuck are they going to finish this in 12 minutes? That's because the thing, there's credits on that as well. And there's like six minutes of credits. Yeah, that, that, that's the thing. I think even when you're in those bits in the middle where nothing's really happening and there are chunks of story missing, the like, you know, the, the scenes you get with Guy Pearce, he's, he's just so captivating that it flies by. The stuff yeah. with... Caster Walder and, and Van Houten, they're both excellent. So those scenes fly by. It all look it's all great to look at. So he's just like, fine, whatever. Switch yeah. your brain off. Go with That's it. it. And I mean, one thing I did liken it to was um we talked about when we did in the name of the king where Ray Liotta was no, never on set with anybody else. They had him for like yeah. a day. Yeah. Guy Pierce kind of feels like that in places where he, he, breezes, he breezes in. So you've got four scenes. Do you want to do them all now or do you want to know? Oh yeah, fuck, I'm I'm free today. I'll do them all, I'll do them all today. But it doesn't the performance doesn't lend itself to that. It, no, the, the, pay, the pacing of them does, but actually, you get the impression he's them. He's 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 as engaged as anybody else in this project. Well, I mean, his missus is in it, so it, it's free holiday for the pair of them. Isn't it? Yeah, so like, he's hanging around anyway. Yeah, exactly. What else is he gonna do? Like, that's that's honestly how I thought he was in it. But from what you said at the start, that well, that it's, can't it's, be uh, the case. Then it's, I, I, I've read it in a few places. Um, yeah, Christina Hendricks was replaced by Karis Van Houten uh, in at the last minute as the as the female lead. Um, so yeah, it's 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 a throwaway line, um, but yeah, who knows? But yeah, I, maybe so. The way maybe he was in it. No, maybe he was attached, and, and they went, needed they needed a female and yeah, it's female like, well, lead, she, and he was like, well, she, she's not working. She's, she's here. Do you, do you she's here her anyway. Do you want to meet her? And 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 she already knows Clark uh, yeah. <laughs> Astor Walder. So yeah, I don't think. Did they ever work together in Game of Thrones? I don't think they did. They'd they have been, a... Well, they'd have been together when they did The Long Night, wouldn't they? Yeah, that would have been about it, I think, though. But, yeah, I mean, they, they would they'd they'd probably, they'd probably have been in, in table reads and stuff together, so they would have yeah. known each other at the very least. So yeah, that makes for, some, makes for some easy chemistry, you'd hope. But who knows? Yeah. From what from what the Palmer's saying, then maybe it wasn't so easy. I don't know. I kind of yeah. want to know what went on behind the scenes now. But Yeah, I, I don't think we'll ever know that, to be honest. By and large, if you could just like razor out that entire terrorist section, I, I'd be calling this pretty good. I've got to be honest, I mean, I, I hadn't thought about it until we were talking about it earlier on. But if you were to razor out the terrorist bits and ch- just ever so slightly change the angle with Ezra and Guy yeah. Pierce, yeah, and It'd be make pretty it pretty good, wouldn't it? Make it more cat and mouse. Yeah, it would be a far better film. I'm just reading. Um, just reading a bit more about the um, about the production. Um, due to production issues, considerable sections of the original script were not filmed. There you go, then. So it was it, maybe so, it was there on the page. Maybe it would be an unfair to the writer as well. Quite possibly. Um, and I mean, I think there's no, there's there's blame needs to be laid in quite a lot of places. Uh, I mean, to producers of, by the sound of it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, no. If you're producing film, produce the film. If you're going to cut bits, it still needs to hang together. Your editor needs to be able to pick that up. Your yeah. director needs to be able to pick that up. And it, yeah, it just sounds like they've gone, look, this is the film we're making. Shut the fuck up, do your job, or we'll get somebody who will. Yeah. Again, that's supposition on my part, but it's, you know, from what I've read, it sounds like it was very much a case of, look, this is the film we're making. Like it, lump it, whatever, make it. This is it. Yeah, exactly. And um, I mean, yeah. So it's, it, it's disappointing um, because you know, there's potential here. I do think they've got the format wrong. I think they'd be better off doing a three, four, six episode se- uh, series with it. Agreed, definitely. Because it, it I mean, there's like there's, a scope, TV show. there's scope there as well with those two leads that so you you could actually spin it out. Even even if you were, even if you weren't able to get Guy Pierce to do a, to do a, to do a show, you say right that character can be replaced after the first season. We can get somebody else in to be the CIA person next year. Yeah, and it happens all the time. Yeah, it would work far better because he's he's not a lead, yeah. uh, and actually you can tell quite a convincing story. Uh, I think that would have been far more beneficial than doing it as um, doing it as a as an, an eighty nine minute film or an eighty three minute film with shit tons of credits. Agreed, totally agreed. Um, but a film is what we got. Um, yeah. 
And yeah, uh, for my money, I think it's better than Mario Brothers as well. So I do too. Um, I, I was I was just going to ask you. I mean, for for me, it's it passes quicker. Yeah, oh, hundred percent. This is one of the easiest things that we've watched on this show, without a shadow of a doubt. This did yeah. not feel like effort at all. No, this feels. I mean, and we've talked about this before on this show and other shows that when we used to edit and we used to find what was largely accepted as shit films, which is the yeah. genesis of this show. Yeah. This feels like something we'd have thrown on going right. It's a dude from Game of Thrones. It's an hour and a half. We've yeah. got that. We can leave that rendering. We can, you know, we can go, you know, grab something to eat, chuck this on, and you know, kill an hour and a half while we wait. Yeah, it, it feels it like that. And I, for me, I say it didn't feel like a slog. It, no, I say time wise, it flew. I, where I, I thought we were about half, I was about halfway through, and I was right at the end. Yeah, pacing, pacing is off. I say third act is non-existent, but by and large, and I'd say problematic issues you know, with uh, with depictions of terrorists and things like that. By and large, I would say yes, it's definitely better than Mario. And I, I, if I had the two in front of me, I would probably pick to watch this again. I, I would definitely pick to watch this again. I'm not going to go looking to watch it again, but yeah. I wouldn't turn it off if it was on TV. Um, you know, I, 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 yeah, if you put the two in front of me with a gun to my head, I'd probably watch this of Mario. And that's coming from somebody that quite likes Mario as well. Yeah. Um, Although, to be honest, I would just give the gun to Nicola Castor World. He'd fucking lose it anyway. Well, yeah, and, and you'd be fine. Uh, there's probably a reason why he had swords uh, in Game of Thrones. Uh, and he managed to cut his own, get his arm fucking cut off with them as well. well I, I, he, so. I was going to say, that's, that's, uh, that's why they had to get, let his arm grow back before they put him in this. Yeah. He can't, um, he can't shoot the gun with an immobile finger. No. Uh, so, yeah, I, I would watch it again. So what we're saying in, in a roundabout way is you fucking lied to us, Internet. Like, yeah. we, were ex- we were expecting garbage. <laughs> yeah. And it's I mean, not. It's like... not. I mean, I, I'm surprised, actually, because as you, as you said earlier, it's, it seems to be quite a Marmite film. Mm. But the people who liked it haven't been as vocal about it, well, which there is are, difficult. There, there are, are some positive some reviews, but not posi- any. Yeah. And, and the positive ones are, I think, too positive then. There's the, there are none that are kind of where we are with it, which is like, yeah, it's fine. Yeah. You know, which, which it, I think is a fair enough. assumption of it. it. It's, it's fine. Really. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, well, it's, yeah, yeah it, 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 it's fine. I mean, as always, if we're wrong, tell us, um, yeah. but, we, we, and if you can be as funny as these reviews, definitely <laughs> tell us. We'll read them out. Yeah. We'll shout you out. Yeah. But, um, um, yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't think this is a, I mean, it's it's been negatively received, but I don't think this is a bad film. Um, and I mean, some of the reviews it had, um, it, it didn't go very well. Um, it was, let's see, there's there's two reviews I, I read earlier, which was uh, which were I um, which one I did so. Uh, the first one is um, was from Rolling Stone. It described it as a messy, uneven, heavy-handed, and occasionally inspired, often insipid, st- uh, ster- steroidally stylistic De Palma joint. So somebody likes words, um, yeah. but based, no, basically saying it's frustrating. What we said is it's that good in parts. It's frustrating. About right. Yeah, yeah, it does. It's, no, I mean that that reviewer gave it two and a half out of five. Um, yeah. Then you've got um, uh, Peter. Sud- oh fucking hell! Here we go. Subchinsky. I apologize, I said that wrong. From RogerEbert.com, gave it three and a half out of four, saying it's it's not great, uh, great De Palma film, but in its best moments, it reminds you just how great he is. And I think that's probably that's exactly what we've been saying, isn't it? Yeah, like, and and De Palma does get a fair bit of stick these days as well. Like, yes, yes, he's, yes, his his glory days are behind him, but like, he's in his fucking seventies. Like, as I say, he's eighty. Yeah. No, he's yeah, he, he he's earned the right to make a couple of turkeys if he wants to. I mean, look, Ridley Scott makes fucking turkeys now as well. Like, Spielberg's not doing Indiana Jones five for a fucking reason, I'm sure. Yeah. So I mean, like these guys are old now, and that's yeah. not to say this is a talent that you you lose, but it, what I'm saying is, but it's, you know, it's a passion make, thing, isn't it? It's a passion thing, and also if you make as many films as these guys have made, yeah. sooner or later, one of them is going to be shit. It yeah. just so happens in De Palma's case recently, a lot of them be shit. But let's not forget, you know, it's not that long ago he gave us Mission Impossible. Probably, well, yeah, probably, that's it. Probably I mean, 20 years, but <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Oh, fuck me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm old. Um, yeah. Um, but yes, I mean, I, I, I'm on board with this. I, I said I, I, there, there was more they could have done with it. I think they, it could have been a better film. And I certainly think there are bits it didn't need. But... Mm. Yeah, 
I mean, I'm... like, it didn't need the fucking Muslim terrorist angle at all. Yeah. It's horrible. But other than, take that out. Take that out and rejig the plot you've got with and Ezra I'm, and, and Guy Pierce. I'm on board with that. Yeah, a reluctant, totally a reluctant assassin who's who's only he's doing it because they've got his family. It's fucking taken. Yeah. Basically, yeah. Um, but that's look, that's fine. How many other fucking versions are taken are there out yeah, there? Exactly. I'll exactly. watch one. I, I, fucking Nicola Castawald or Guy Pierce and Carice Van Houten in all day long. So yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't yeah. have a, I don't have a problem with that at all. Um, as as you said, no, if if if, if people listening want to disagree with that, by all means, get in touch, reach out, and we'll we'll we'll, we'll talk about it. Um, because now it's it's something that I've I think this has been probably more harshly taken because it doesn't because it doesn't fit a modern style and a modern narrative. Structure. I definitely think that's what it is. I think people are looking at it and going, "This looks old. I don't like it." Yeah. No. I, 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 how how can this be made in twenty in, in twenty nineteen and and you know, feel like it belongs in the seventies? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I I get it. I I like it. Um, so do I. I. I like it a great deal. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to work out a way of, of being slightly negative because that's what we do on the show. But yeah, I, I like it. I'm I'm on board. This is um, this is one of the better films we've watched on this show. I'm going to go oh, as yeah. far as saying that. Yeah, I haven't ranked the ones we've watched. I I, I did meet some people last weekend who um, were asking what the, the the best and worst ones we've done are, and I wasn't sort of I, I, I sort of dodged that one quite nicely. I, I don't tend to rank them rank them, but this is quite high up the list. This would be. Yeah. One of the better ones, which I say, look, if you if you're going to pick the 26, 27 films we've done for this show, if you if you want to watch, I don't know, three, this would be this in is those probably three. Probably in there. There's this. There's Rubber. Um, I, I'm I'm failing because I've forgotten what ones we've done already. But there's probably more. Than... Oh, a fucking Suicide Squad. We did as yeah. well. Like, yeah. They're they're all all fine. Rubber's actually really good. But other than that, all fine. Like you want the worst? No question about it. Battlefield Earth. We still haven't got anything as bad as Battlefield. I don't, it's fairly closely followed by Three Six Five Days, though. That's that's definitely the next one, uh, and then in the name of the King. Yes, but, you know. I, well, Although that that gave, that gave us my favorite my favorite episode of this show. So. And there's Loquitia to count into that as well. Oh yeah, I forgot about Loquitia. I've repressed so, Loquitia. You know, when when we watch shit like that. Look, it makes stuff like this look like Citizen fucking Kane, honestly. So, you know, this is not by no means, listeners, is this the fucking worst film you're ever going to watch. So give it a look. Maybe just skip past the bits with the fucking terrorists in. Yeah. And you'll be fine. Yeah, that's it. Um, yeah. But yeah, we'd love to know what you think uh, of this film because, as I say, it's, no, it's, it seems to have divided the internet quite well. Um, mm-hmm. Reach out, get in touch uh, on Twitter at DD Pod. You can go to our website, ddpodcast.net, where you can also get our uh, previous episodes and our other shows as well. Uh, on Facebook and YouTube with the Double Down Podcast Network, uh, wherever you get your podcasts from, via iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, Amazon Music. Like, share, subscribe, leave some messages, we can back the best we can. But until next time. See you later. <laughs>